Tell us what are the hurdles you're facing as an organization in terms of delivering aid? Look, a lot, of, a lot of the challenges are just getting aid in. Um, and that's one of the great frustrations when you think about some of the unprecedented malnutrition rates in Gaza and to think that, you know, five or 10 kilometers from where I am, there are hundreds of trucks lining up to come in with the food, the water, the medicine. So it's about the obstructions, about clearances, getting that aid in. Once it's in, there will be challenges. People are desperate. But if people know there's going to be a regular flow of aid, then they will trust the system. They won't think they're going to get aid once a, once a week or once a month. So, you know, the United Nations works in difficult places, Somalia, Afghanistan. We know how to deliver that aid, but we need to get so much more in, and particularly, particularly to the north. Do you feel like the whole procedure Israel has imposed in terms of checks is deliberately slowing down the aid? I can't speak to intent, but it is slowing down the aid. There is no doubt of that. And that they, they, as the occupying power, have a responsibility to expedite the aid. But we're not seeing that. You know, if you just look just at numbers, before this war, Gaza got around 500 trucks a day, humanitarian and commercial. It's around a third of that over the duration of this war. So about a third, two thirds missing. And that's why we see these critical levels of malnutrition. It's why we see, you know, such shortages of water because water systems have been destroyed, decimated, and we haven't been able to repair them. And again, whatever numbers, whatever aid has come in, much, much less has been received in the north. How would you assess the situation in terms of contagious infectious diseases spreading in Gaza right now? That's another nightmare scenario when you've got such malnutrition and such bad sanitation and children and adolescent girls queuing for five or six hours to use a toilet. Any big disease outbreak would be would be lethal. We know that there are, we know that we've got massive spikes, 20, 30 times the number of, of children getting things like diarrhea and so on. And there's just hospitals don't have the capacity. Two thirds of hospitals aren't functioning. It's difficult and dangerous for people to get to hospitals. Most of them are dealing with children with the wounds of war, the shrapnel, the burns. Uh, and so families are having to manage this without the medicines, often without just clean water. And again, all these supplies, the water, the medicines, they're not far away. Tell me if you feel like the food insecurity right now benefits Israel. In, and if you feel like this, the starvation is used as a weapon of, of war. No, again, I just, I cannot speak to, to the intention of, of, of either of these warring parties. I can only speak to the impact. And the impact of what's happening is very clear. The impact is you've now got one in three children under the age of, ch of two, one in three suffering acute malnutrition in the north that didn't have a malnourishment issue six months ago. One in three, it's, a, it's an unprecedented rise into catastrophic levels of malnutrition. Um, and the United Nations, UNICEF, World Health Organization, World Food Program, we know what to do if we can get the aid in. We know how to distribute it. But we are getting very close to catastrophe upon catastrophe. In this crisis, if there was no war, we would still have the highest level humanitarian crisis based on the devastation of homes, based on the lack of food, the devastation to water systems, to the health care system. We have all of that. But we still have a very active, a very ferocious war. When you're saying that you know what you have to do if only they let you do it, what's specifically the solution you're envisaging? It's not very complicated in terms of aid. It's, it's just loosening restrictions, you know, speeding up processes at the border, making sure that there's something called dual usage. So in a truck, if something is found that they consider might have dual usage and this could be recently if there were reports of you know of scissors then the whole truck is returned so expediting things like that more openings you know there are right now aid is coming through one area there could be four or five points including a couple in the north that would greatly increase the amount of aid we could be getting into people so those things are very very clear expedite it get rid of the obstructions open up more access routes 
But the best of all, the thing that would be the game changer for the children of Gaza would be a ceasefire. If there is a ceasefire, how long would it take for you to reach at least a balance or at least the same situation as before the invasion in Gaza in terms of delivering the aid and helping the people, in terms of food security, in, term, in terms of medical care? Yeah, food security, I can speak to the, the, the most severely malnourished children. It's a very quick turnaround. You, you change a child's life in, in a matter of weeks. Um, you know, in terms of massive aid distribution of food. Again, uh, I don't have this, the, the expertise to speak about how long that would take. It's something World Food Program do, but it would be, we, the game would be changed very, very quickly. The medical system will take longer. You know, I, I was in a hospital a few days ago um, and it's no longer functioning. You know, it's, it's been, the, the ground floor has been devastated. The top levels will require a great deal of repair. You've seen active conflict um, and ground offensive in a lot of hospitals. The health system is on its knees. That will take much longer. But all of these things can only start once we get a ceasefire. And one last thing, because there has always been a, a debate about the death toll. I know UNICEF has put forward a toll regarding the, the children, which is devastating, which is absolutely uh, dramatic. Looking at those numbers, over 30,000 children killed, UNICEF is saying, based on the numbers you're getting from the uh, health ministry in Gaza, which is controlled by Hamas. Tell me what makes you trust those numbers? So, yeah, so the most recent number showing that more than 13,000 children uh, have been killed. If we break that down, that's something like 80 girls and boys killed on average, as the reports go, every single day uh, since this war has been going. They are reported numbers. Usually UNICEF, yes, we will do a very a very detailed type of verification. It's called triangular verification. You can imagine what that looks like. It takes much longer. The fact is, in previous conflicts, we have used the same Ministry of Health, yes, Ministry of Health uh, data, and it's been shown once we've then been able to do our triangular, much more painstaking verification, that it's it's been shown to be accurate to have faith in those numbers. That's, so that's where we are now. Remembering, of course, that these numbers may be an undercount. We're not talking about what might be thousands of children, certainly thousands of civilians under the rubble. Thank you so much for all this uh, data and all this information you're providing, Mr. Elder, and good luck there. Thanks very much. Good to speak.